In this video, we're going to prove a couple of key properties of integral domains. Just as a reminder, I've put the definition of integral domain here. An integral domain is a commutative ring, that is a ring with commutative multiplication, with unity, so there's a multiplicative identity, and no zero divisors. So we're going to prove a couple of things. The first one is about cancellation. So just to set things up, consider the following ring. Consider the ring R equals Z mod 6, all right, which is not an integral domain. Because, for example, there are these two non-zero elements that multiply to zero. Uh, so both of these, 2 and 3, are zero divisors in Z mod 6. Okay, so not an integral domain. So suppose I told you I'm thinking of two elements of Z mod 6, X and Y, both in Z mod 6, such that... 3x equals 3y. Does it follow that x equals y? In other words, can I cancel a common factor the same way that I did when we were talking about groups? And the answer is actually it, it doesn't follow at all. We can't cancel that 3. The answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is because, for example, we could have x equals 2 and y equals 4, and then both of these would be equal to 0 in Z mod 6. So I know that 3x is equal to 3y, but it doesn't follow that x equals y. So Z6, Z mod 6 is a setting where I can't cancel a common factor on both sides of an equation. So the next thing you might wonder is, when can I do that? And the answer to that question is given exactly by the idea of integral domain. As long as I have an integral domain, no zero divisors, I can cancel a common factor. Uh, we're assuming here that the scope of our discussion is going to be commutative rings with unity. So here's a the theorem. Let R be a commutative ring with unity. Then R has the multiplicative cancellation property. Multiplicative, that's a long word there. If and only if R is an integral domain. All right, so we're going to prove that. By the way, in case there's any lack of clarity here, the multiplicative cancellation property, so multiplicative cancellation property, is that if A, X, and Y are in R such that A is non zero and AX equals a y then x equals y that's the multiplicative cancellation property so we will show that integral domains satisfy this and non-integral domains do not satisfy this so here's the proof first let's suppose that we don't have an integral domain okay well we're assuming r is commutative with unity so the only way it can't be an integral domain is if it has zero divisors so then R has a zero divisor, call it X. Okay, so then there exists some A, a non zero A in R such that AX equals zero. That's what it means to be a zero divisor. Okay, but then we have a times x equals a times 0, because anything times 0 is 0 in a ring. So if a times x is equal to a times 0, but x is not equal to 0 because x is a 0 divisor, being a 0 divisor means that you are non 0 well, look at this. So I've got x non 0, but a times x is equal to a times 0. So this is a situation where the a cannot be canceled. So that means R fails the multiplicative cancellation property. I'll just say R does not have the multiplicative cancellation property. Okay, so that's one direction of the proof. 
And technically, that's the direction of the proof that says if R has the multiplicative cancellation property, then R has to be an integral domain. What we did was we proved the contrapositive of that. So that is the rightward direction. Now for the leftward direction. Suppose R is an integral domain. And we will prove R has the multiplicative cancellation property. Okay, so for that, let's assume A, X, and Y belong to R, and A is non-zero, such that A, X equals A, Y. We need to prove that X equals Y. If I can prove that, then that means that anytime I have this situation, A, X equals A, Y, and A is non-zero, I can cancel off that A. That proves the multiplicative cancellation property. I don't know why that ended up having a slash through it. That was unintentional. I think it was just my pen skipped or something. Uh, anyway, so let's assume all of that. We assume A, X, and Y are in R. A is non-zero. A, X equals A, Y. Okay. Well, since A, X equals A, Y, we can subtract A, Y from both sides and get ax minus ay equals zero. And because we know that multiplication distributes not just over addition but subtraction, this implies a times x minus y is equal to zero. But now we know that r is an integral domain, so a and x minus y cannot be zero divisors. So because r is an integral domain and has no zero divisors, we must have either a equal to zero, which is false because we assumed a was non-zero, or x minus y equals zero. So we assumed a is non-zero, so x minus y equals zero. And then we can add the y back to both sides and get x equals y, which is what we wanted. So ax equaling a y and a non-zero implies x equals y. Therefore, therefore, r has the multiplicative cancellation property. Okay, so in other words, integral domains are exactly those commutative rings with unity, which have the multiplicative cancellation property, which is pretty darn cool. Okay, so I'm gonna minimize that, or pull that over here. So now recall that in a previous video, we proved that every field is an integral domain. So write that down, every field is an integral domain. And in brief, the reason for that was if you have a field and you imagine or try to imagine two non-zero elements multiplying to zero, it's not gonna work out because any non-zero element in a field has a multiplicative inverse. You can use that multiplicative inverse to knock off one of the elements and prove the other element has to be zero. So a field can't have zero divisors. Uh, and therefore, any field has to be an integral domain. But now we're going to prove something kind of like the converse, but not exactly the converse, because in, in one of the previous videos, we showed that there are integral domains that are not fields. But under certain conditions, the converse actually surprisingly is true. So here's a theorem. Every finite integral domain every finite integral domain is a field. Isn't that nuts? And here's the proof. All right, so we're going to prove every finite integral domain is a field. So let's assume R is a finite integral domain. Okay, so it's commutative. It has unity. So it satisfies two of the necessary conditions for being a field. We, need, we just need to prove that every non-zero element of R has a multiplicative inverse. So let X be an element of R, 
x non zero, we will show we will show that x has a multiplicative inverse in R. And the way we're going to do this is kind of clever. It's kind of cute, actually. So the way that we're going to do it is we're going to define a function f from r to itself as follows. f of y is going to equal x times y for every y in the ring. So in other words, we take every element of the ring, just multiply it on the left by x. Okay, and multiplying on the left, multiplying on the right, that distinction doesn't matter. R is commutative, but let's just make a decision. Now, just as an aside, uh, we're just defining a function from the ring to itself. We're not assuming this function has any special algebraic properties, really. We're not assuming it's a homomorphism. In fact, once we define ring homomorphisms, we will see that this usually isn't a homomorphism of rings. But it's actually going to be kind of useful for us anyway, even though it doesn't really have any special algebraic operation preserving properties. Okay, so here's what we're going to show. We're going to show f is 1 to 1. Why would we do that? Well, you'll see in a minute. Okay, and it actually turns out it's not too hard to show f is 1 to 1. Here's why f is 1 to 1. Let's assume that f of y1 equals f of y2 for some y1 and y2 in R. Okay? In other words, let, let y1 and y2 be elements of R such that f of y1 equals f of y2. Well then, by definition of what f is, that means xy1 equals xy2. But now wait, R is an integral domain. So it has the MCP, the multiplicative cancellation property. So by the MCP, that means Y1 has to equal Y2, <laughs> and that's it. So if the outputs are the same from F, then the inputs have to be the same. So F is one to one. Okay, now why did we bother with such a thing? Well, think about if we have a function from a finite set to itself, and we know it's one to one, then what else do we know? So since f is from r, a finite set to itself, f also has to be on 2. Because it's mapping a finite number of things to the same finite number of things, so from here to here, and it's mapping in such a way that each element of the domain goes to a different element of the range. And if each element of the domain goes to a different element of the uh, codomain here, then that means that every element of the codomain has to get used as an output, otherwise I'd have to have two things going to the same output. Which would, which would violate being one-to-one. -one. So f has to be surjective. And because f is on two, there exists some y in R such that f of y equals one, the multiplicative identity of R. And sorry, I'm using, I know I'm using y as an input, which is a little bit awkward, but I was kind of locked into that by choosing x as my thing I'm trying to find an inverse of. Okay, so that means xy is equal to 1, which means x has a multiplicative inverse. That deserves an exclamation mark. And that was true for every non-zero x. I didn't assume anything special about x except it being non-zero. So since every, so since every non-zero x in R has a multiplicative inverse, and I also have those other necessary properties, commutativity and a multiplicative identity. So because that is true, R is a field. And then we are done. That deserves a QED. That's just such an elegant little proof. So we don't know that every integral domain is a field, but we do know that every finite integral domain is a field. And as a result, there are not all that many finite integral domains. 
Uh, there are finite fields. There's a whole study of finite fields. It's pretty interesting, and we're not going to get into all of it in this course. But outside of that, outside of the finite fields, there aren't any other finite integral domains. This theorem proves it.